Hi everyone, I'm Mike and this is the Sunday Art Show. Very excited about the subject of this week's painting. I paint a lot of cattle. They're one of my favourite subjects, but until recently I hadn't discovered the Rigget Galloway and these cattle are truly unique looking. They're an ancient and native UK breed. They come in a range of sizes, colours and pattern styles, but what makes them truly distinctive is they have a single white stripe running down the length of their back. So a big thank you to Jeremy from twomills.uk. Please go and give him a follow on Instagram uh, because he very kindly said I could use some of his photos as reference for some paintings. So my plan is to do a you know, pretty big uh, full-on acrylic painting of these wonderful, unique-looking creatures. But the subject of this week's video, I'm just going to do a line and wash watercolour study as a preliminary step to kind of get used to how I want to paint these particular animals. So big thank you to Jeremy. Please check out his Instagram, which is Instagram forward slash two mills. So let's get going. So I'm starting out with a4 mixed media paper that's taped down at the edges with some masking tape. And I'm using a uni pen, sorry, uni pin fine line marker pen. And these pens come in a range of nib sizes. They also put down water resistant ink. So that means they're great for watercolour line and wash studies because obviously the line work doesn't go anywhere. And if you saw the range of videos I did, or the series of videos called the Animal Alphabet Challenge, uh, which I put up on the channel, I can't remember when that ended now, it probably ended best part of a year ago, but it was 26 videos, one for each letter of the alphabet. And I would do a Sharpie marker pen drawing of a particular animal, you know, A for armadillo and so on. And then on top of that, Sharpie marker pen drawing, at least for the later videos, in probably the, la the latter half of the alphabet, I would use watercolour washes on top. So the challenge was to do the drawing with the Sharpie marker pen, because obviously, you know, once you put a mark down with the Sharpie, you can't get rid of it at all. So quite a challenge, great fun. You can put down swathes of really dark darks with a Sharpie marker. Um, this is a similar idea, but the nibs are finer, so it's more about line work and cross hatching and things like that. So in terms of line work, what I'm doing here, having got the beginnings of the animal's head in place, is I'm trying to keep the line work interesting in terms of its character. So what I mean by that is I'm not going for the absolute neatest line possible. What I'm doing is including bits of broken line, for example, on the lower edges of the ears. And in addition to that, what I'm doing is as I'm drawing and looking at the reference, I'm thinking, OK, well, I've got to go from point A down to point B. How far is that? And at what angle do I need to draw a line? So that's kind of standard drawing. But then what I'm doing is when I move the pen is I'm kind of allowing the pen to wander a little bit and do its own thing and then bring it back on course and then letting it wander again repeatedly, very quickly within the course of one line. So what I'm hoping to achieve by doing that is creating a sense of life in the drawing, but also creating a randomness to each mark I make. So there's some character to the drawing so I can do some wiggles and squiggles to capture some of the fluffiness and the tangles of the hair on this uh, you know incredible looking animal, but without it looking too repetitive and sort of um, you know, I don't want to repeat the same motif everywhere. I just want to kind of capture some of the character of the surface of this animal. So while I was chatting away there, uh, put in the front legs, we've got the beginnings of a back. Here's the belly coming in, going from right to left. And you can see just then on the back, I used multiple lines and that's OK. You know, it's OK to have a little bit of sketchiness going on in the drawing. And in terms of the full on acrylic painting that I hope to create in a few weeks time, and I'll put that up on the channel as well, um, there may not be as much drawing evident in the final painting. And in fact, there may be no drawing evident at all. 
But from my point of view, these early studies are really, really valuable because it kind of educates my brain and, and you know, allows me to experiment a little bit in terms of how I can best depict these animals in the way that suits my style. So even though there probably won't be too many very fine black wiggly lines in the final acrylic painting, there might be something analogous to that. So some of the brushwork I use with the acrylic might end up having some of that character. Now, at the top of the tail that I just drew, you can see I changed the type of marks again to try and capture a different type of fluffiness there compared to, say, the fluffiness of the edges of the ears. And then as we get towards the bottom of the tail, there's a kind of wavy nature to that. So again, try to capture some of that movement. I'm also paying particular attention to the boundary lines between the white patches of hair and the dark areas of hair as well. So we need to put in a fourth leg and notice in the reference the the feet of the hind legs are much lower down in frame than the front legs. So I need to be aware of that when we draw those in. But, you know, I don't have to copy the reference too carefully. Just want to be inspired by it. Now, I've avoided detail all the way through for the most part. You know, I've allowed myself a few detailed uh, wiggles and squiggles to capture the fluffiness. But in terms of the face, nothing at all, really. There's the main kind of block of the nose just put in. And then for the eyes, I'm going to put in loops, approximately the shape of the eyes, but bigger. So that it, when I come to the watercolour, if I need to make them smaller, that's going to be a lot easier than trying to lift off paint to make them larger. All right, well, I've added a wash of just lemon yellow to the background. And while that's still wet, I'm now coming in using a flat brush with a mixture of cad yellow and lemon yellow. And I'm just putting that on a little more intensely to put in some a little bit of texture, really. I'm not going to try and capture the full background that we've got in the reference, but I want to give this animal an environment to occupy. So when I make these marks, and you can see I've now added a little bit of um, just a little bit of green, basically, just to the yellow I had. Um, what I'm doing is I'm keeping the paint fairly fluid. I've got my paper tipped up at a slight angle, maybe 20 degrees above horizontal. And I'm putting the brush down in different ways. So what I mean by that is sometimes I'll just touch the corner of the brush, sometimes the full edge, sometimes the side of the brush. Sometimes I will just do a sweeping brush stroke like I'm doing now. Other times, you know, I'll move the brush very rapidly. So again, just like the line work, I wanted to keep an element of randomness in the mark making. Same approach with the background and going darker with the green now, just, go, just going along the little pans of green I have in my watercolour kit. Just picked the lightest green earlier. Now I'm going to the next uh, green along, the slightly darker one. For the background and stuff like that, to be honest, it doesn't matter too much. What I find is more important is keeping the tone appropriate for what I want to achieve. And in the same way I'm varying my mark making, you don't want to, or I don't want to repeat the same colour too often. So you want a variation of tone and colour. Because in nature, if you look at a lawn or a tree or a bush, you know, and you say, well, what colour is it? Well, it's green. And of course it is. But there's a huge range of different greens and yellows and reds and oranges tucked away in there and browns and things. So we want to try and capture some of that. So I've switched to a round mop brush now. And on the side of this particular animal, the hair seems to be kind of swirling out from uh, almost as if the hair has been combed up on the upper half of the of the cow's side and then combed down on the lower half. So I wanted to capture some of that texture with my initial marks. So I'm using some uh, just violet watercolour paint straight out of the tube by Windsor & Newton here. And as mentioned, I'm putting down some marks which would very approximately capture that kind of swirling hair pattern. And then as I move gradually away from the side, it's sort of another element of drawing, really, even though I'm using the brush. I'm just putting on a few 
hair like marks or clumps of hair like marks. In some ways, they're contours, really. So where the, where the hair is curving around the top of the hindquarters or curving around the side of the animal. And then, then in other areas where, you know, it's a bit straighter, I can do straight marks or even just use the side, the side of the brush to swathe in a little bit of colour like I'm doing now to the left of the head. So again, keeping my mark making varied, avoiding the pattern of just repeating the same style of mark or application of paint over and over again. And if the paint pulls a little bit in places like it is now, absolutely fine with me. I like those little accidental effects you get in watercolour. So gradually working my way around the animal, putting in still a relatively light wash at this stage. Then onto the hindquarters, changing the type of mark making again. So I've got a slightly bigger area to work with here compared to what I was doing a moment ago. Because I wanted to avoid previously those initial marks I'd put down. But again, having put in that little wash, I've now changed the way I'm applying the paint as I go to the edge of the wash and to the top of that tail. And being mindful of keeping areas completely free of paint for those light areas of the hair. Over to the head, the ears are pretty much uh, all in shadow. Even within those shadows, though, there are you know, variations in tone, but we'll get to that later. I'm being also fairly careful. I didn't let the background completely dry at this stage, so I'm being fairly careful to not mix the application of this purple with any of the background colour also. And if that means leaving a little bit of white around the edge of the drawing at the moment, then that's what I'm going to do, because we can address that later. So then just the lower part of the rear leg there. And then that's more or less the first purple wash done, I think. All right, well, I let that wash dry and now I'm coming in with a flat brush and some cobalt blue. So my plan is to, you know, more or less cover the rest of the animal in this cobalt blue. There will be areas where I'm just covering the white of the paper and then other areas where I'm darkening the purple that I've got down already. So, for example, the ears are in shadow, as mentioned earlier. So can add some blue there. And the right hand side of the head as well is also somewhat in shadow. can't re remember if I just said it, but um, I'm back to the flat brush now. Then I can lightly use the edge of the brush to add in little bits of texture to again begin to capture some of the surface of the hair that's kind of falling across the head and across the nose and cheek. And then there's a shadow there as well, just above that left hand eye. And then under the head, things get quite a bit darker. So overlaying different colours, different washes of watercolour is a great way to produce subtle colours that you might not get if you just try to mix that colour directly. And got to think carefully about the angle of the brush here for this bit at the top. And 
and then for the side of the animal I can just forget about the texture a little bit now and just kind of put in a wash which covers up that purple wash I put down earlier but of course the purple will still show through So it's a nice way of, you've got areas where you're just putting blue on white paper. So you get a nice pure blue. You cover up the purple, so you get some darker purples. The boundary between the light and the dark is more subdued than it would have been with just the purple and white. And here I'm just coming in with a little bit more of an intense mix to darken that area on the leg. And in doing that, that kind of brings us to the next uh, point is that you know the wash won't be completely consistent everywhere so you you get some sort of nice gradation of color and tone as well but notice here even though i'm just putting in a, a wash i still curve the brush strokes there on the belly and there just uh, at the top of the leg to begin to do a little bit of modeling And then I can even go back over areas that I've painted previously with blue while it's still wet because I'm putting the same colour uh, in again. And, you know, working wet in wet gives us a different effect to just laying one wash on top of a completely dry wash. So what I've just done uh, off camera is mixed in some of that cobalt blue with the purple or the violet that I used for the initial wash with the kind of texture on the side of the animal. Again, both used more intensely than before. So now I'm coming in with a nice dark, you know, really juicy shadow color, but it's very much in harmony with the blue wash and the pale purple wash that I put down before because it's made from the same two components. And I'm working, you know, as just mentioned, wet and wet now. And, you know, if I get a few cauliflowers, you know, which hasn't happened yet, but if I do, that's OK. I'll just incorporate them into the squiggles and wiggles of the hair of this particular animal. So the way we approach painting a subject, we, you know, we can vary it. Um, sometimes what I do is, and this, this was true for the Animal Alphabet Challenge as well. Sometimes what I do is I think simply tonally and having done a line drawing, you pick out the big blocks of shadow and that creates an illusion of three dimensions. And then on top of that, you can add color. What I'm doing here is rather the reverse. So I've done the line drawing, that's still the same, but then I've kind of added texture from at, at the very beginning, really, with the purple, the first wash. And now having done that, I'm now building up layers of tone, still keeping in mind a little bit of texture here and there with my brushwork. You know, if I, you know, if I move the brush fairly quickly as I'm doing there, just on the underside of the belly or here on the side of the animal, I can still create some kind of hair like marks. But for the most part, I'm picking out patches of tone. So it's a good exercise to if you if you're used to working in a particular way, you know, just in simple terms, think of it. What's step one? What's step two? What's step three in terms of creating a painting? You might want to reverse them or swap the order. So, for example, with if I, if I was going to do something very different for this with this uh, medium, uh, instead of drawing first, I might block in big shapes with washes first and then once that's dry come in with the fine line pen and doing a and do a drawing on top so you know completely reverse the process uh, and if, if you happen to catch last week's video where i did three watercolor portrait warm-ups that's kind of a good illustration video if you're interested in that kind of mixing up your technique approach because all three portraits were watercolor but I approached them in different ways. 
But while I've been chatting there, you can see I've, I'm using this small flat, which is a little frayed at the ends to put in some textural marks on the legs. And I also did something similar on the hindquarters as well. But the, the animal's starting to come to life out of the background now that we've darkened things. So back in with darker shadows again. Similar mix, but I've added a little bit of uh, neutral tint to the mix as well now. Bit of indecision on the brush to use here or getting the mix right so having um having sort of left the dark dark shadows for the moment what i decided to do here was just enhance some of the very subtly reflected colors on the underside of the animal where we've got some sort of orangey browns um, bouncing off of the the white i'm not matching the color on the nose and the reference all that carefully here. What I'm doing instead is using the same orangey brown. I think it's a mix of yellow ochre, a bit of orange, a bit of yellow. And I'm using that in a couple of key places throughout the painting. So, and now uh, before I continue on that point, I'm just adding a little pale bit of cerulean blue on the tail there as well. So as I said, there are so, sort of some subdued blues there as well. Uh, on patches of the white. But back to this orangey brown, the idea is not to necessarily copy exactly what's going on in the reference, but if I'm going to put a bit of orange on the belly, let's have a bit of the same orange on the nose and a couple of places elsewhere, because that's going to keep things harmonious in terms of the colour scheme for the final painting. And while I was chatting away there, what I'm doing on the background is a similar colour, but with a little bit of raw umber in there as well, and just introducing some of that orangey brown, slightly different to the ground. And then in the reference, there isn't particularly a strong shadow, uh, cast shadow. In fact, you know, there's barely one at all. But for my drawing and painting, I want to include some evidence that the animal's kind of standing on solid ground and it's a 3D thing. So we can imagine it would cast a shadow. And I've added a little bit more of that uh, raw umber to the mix and putting down some random marks with a small round brush here. And then within those random marks, just teasing out the odd blade of grass, ensuring that not every blade has the same angle. But there are a few blades of grass which are curved. Some of them might have sharp angles in them. Again, just trying to keep things random in appearance. So if you look now at what I've created compared to the reference, my colours are much more vibrant. So at this stage, you know, I'm starting very much to think more and more about what's working for my painting compared to, you know, what's going on in the, in the photograph. And with that in mind, what I want to stand out much more than it currently is, is the white of that white stripe along the back and the white of the tail. So in order to accomplish that, what, I'm, what I've done here is take some of the green from earlier and I've added some ultramarine blue, quite a lot, to get a much darker green. And I'm putting that darker colour against the animal where there's white in order to make that white pop more than it is so that there's a higher contrast between background and animal. And as I do this, I'm trying to keep random mark making going. I need to have you know, reasonably solid blocks of this dark green against the white so that it stands out. But at the same time, I want to avoid it looking like I've put a, a line of green around the outside of the animal. So I'm kind of trying to break up my line and the texture I'm putting down in the background. So it looks like you know a dark bush, dark hedge, dark tree, whatever it is. And you know it's just part of the painting. 
and and even though I'm doing it for a very specific reason to achieve a particular effect, I don't want it to be too obvious. Now, as I move over to the right hand side, I'm letting the paint go more dilute and the same as I come down lower and lower. So, uh, you know, I want it to be you know, a little bit of tonal variation and lighter again here on this right hand side. So that, that green isn't too out of place in the painting, but I've deliberately kept it darker top left and I'm deliberately making it lighter everywhere else. So again, a paler patch of green near the chest to make that patch of white stand out a bit more. And then what I'm doing now is just more or less random marks to, again, try and disguise the fact that I've deliberately put a patch of green next to that bit of white. So it's all smoke and mirrors, really. You know, it's all little tricks here and there. A little bit of the pale cerulean blue on that same patch of, of white on the chest. And we'll add some of that as well on the white sock of the rear leg. And a couple of licks on the lower end of the tail as well. And then that same colour I can use to start to draw into the head a little bit and do a few little squiggles. Try and capture some of the swirling hair on the forehead or some elements of it at least. I guess what I'm always doing is really making marks which are inspired by the pattern I see rather than trying to copy the pattern itself. But now back in with my dark shadow colour. So this is neutral tint, the violet from before and the cobalt blue. And really just want to put in some nice deep shadows here and there with my round synthetic brush. So in the same way, you know, I want to make the light areas pop by putting a dark area uh, against them. Then, you know, when I add the very dark shadows, that's going to hopefully make some of the colours in the mid-tones pop a little more as well. And even here I can do a little bit of drawing with my brush. You know, not going too crazy, but a few creases in the in the coat or in the flesh of the animal act as contours, but also by taking those lines from one dark area of wash across into a lighter area of wash, it helps visually bridge the gap between those two things. Um, I can still add a, a few little frayed ends to the silhouette as well. So definitely taking a multifaceted approach to the types of mark I'm putting down, regardless of the, the you know the type of brush I'm using and really the colour I'm using as well. Now at this at this stage, you know, I'm starting to ask myself, well, how much more do I I want to do? Um, so I let that paint dry completely, and I'm coming back in with another. Um, uni pin fine line marker. This is actually a 0.8 millimeter nib. I think I did the original drawing with a 0.3. So this is a little bit chunkier, putting down a thicker line, but it's good for putting in, you know, darker uh, and larger regions of shadow. I'm still adding texture as I do this though. And it's also good for kind of bringing the focus to a certain part of the painting. So if I want the focus to be the head, then by making the marks here thicker than they are elsewhere without going too crazy, you know, that's going to emphasize the head. And I can also use this pen to draw in the eyes as well in a, in a fairly simple way. So it's all about getting, you know, the shape of the iris correct. And, you know, the angle we're looking at this animal, that's going to be some kind of ellipse. And we want the principal axis of, of that ellipse to be at the right angle. And then we want to leave a highlight in the eye as well. Now, in reality, the highlight in the eye probably isn't going to be pure white, but I've chosen to leave it as pure white just because I feel it's in keeping with the rest of the painting, not because I think it's a realistic depiction of the reflection in the eye. So if you've seen some of my portrait videos, um, I often spend quite a bit of time getting the reflections in the eyes 
you know, right, they're done in a quite a considered way. And what I mean by that is I'll often start off by putting in fairly subdued colors for the reflected lights in the eyes. But then I will, within those subdued reflections, add just a little pinprick of pure titanium white. So that's kind of the more elaborate, closer to realistic version of, of drawing an eye. This is much more stylized and simplified. I just want enough detail in the eyes to make it look as though the animal could be alive or, you know, and there's something going on behind the eyes. I am uh, careful to have let the paint dry completely here because um, if it is a little bit damp, then these marker pens don't really make the mark you want over the top. You know, there's a slight danger of clogging the nib as well and lifting off some of the, the damp paint. But uh, providing you're just, you know, reasonably gentle when you're doing your drawing on top of the dry paint. And by reasonably gentle, I just mean what I would call normal writing pressure. In other words, as long as you don't, you know, try to plow through the surface of the paper, um, then I find it, you know, you can draw on top uh, with no problem at all. And it's really nice, you know, really good combo. But even in my acrylic paintings, um, as I've mentioned in previous videos, and it's the same with watercolour, I love drawing, painting, drawing, painting, drawing sometimes. So I love to alternate it. And I, I don't view drawing as solely being limited to the early stages of a painting. As far as I'm concerned, you know, you can draw at any stage. And if you want to draw at the very last stage, as I am here, then, you know, why not? Why not? So working my way around the animal, enhancing outlines and frayed edges and boundaries between the, the, the white hair and the darker hair regions, adding little bits of character, enhancing bits which are still showing through from the preliminary drawing, but I feel they're not quite strong enough in terms of line quality. Uh, and in other places where you've got a little haphazard shape formed by one washing but sorry, formed by one wash running into or over another, then you can enhance that that boundary, that little edge that's being created as the paint is dried. Now, some of those shapes are often the most delicious, really, because, you know, you don't create them yourself. They're just automatically created. But when you do that, you don't have to follow them exactly. You can follow them partially and then wander off in your own way. You know, you can do your own thing. It doesn't have to be all or nothing. Now, the thicker or, you know, it's all it's all relative, but the 0.8 millimeter nib is pretty darn good, I would say, for making marks on top of a dark wash like the main body of the animal. And, you know, it's also good for doing these little hairs off the edge of the animal as well. But if you're going on to lighter colors, then you might want to consider if you want to do a bit of cross hatching or something, you might want to consider a finer nib, depending on the patch of white you're trying to cover but I'm talking in terms of what I've got going on here so if I was going to put some shadow in for example on the, the the very bottom part of the belly where there's just that narrow strip of white I think in general this nib would be a bit too thick so I'd be better off switching to one of the narrower uh, narrower versions um, in terms of sizes that are, are available in the little kit I've got of five pens I've got a uh, point uh, 0.1 mil, 0.3 mil, 0.5 mil, 0.8, and then I've got a brush tip as well. Uh, and they're all black, those five pens. So, um, you know, it's a, it gives you quite a lot of flexibility, really. And um, as I say, super good for water, uh, watercolour line and wash. Also great for ink tense watercolour. That works really well. And what I'm doing here is what I mentioned before. I'm kind of picking out random shapes within the washes that I've put down already enhancing some of the, the lines and edges that have occurred naturally and then adding my own extra bits with the pen to just solidify this grass and the ground that the animal is standing on. So rather than drawing grass, what I'm really drawing is tangles and negative shapes within clumps of blades of grass.
So back in with the fine, finer nib, I think this is a 0.5, just adding a, a few little hatch lines on the lighter areas of wash just to add a little bit more definition, enhancing the outlines here and there. Definitely got to be careful of overworking uh, at this stage. So just trying to add as little as I feel is you know necessary to get the result I want. And if in doubt, I would say leave it out. Um, you know, better to do too little, come back a month later and add two extra lines rather than you know, put down five extra lines, which which ruin the, the image. The other thing you can do is you can outline and leave a gap between the painted washes and the final drawing marks you put down. You don't have to stick to the edge of the washes you've put down. If you feel the outline isn't quite what you want, then feel free to wander away from the bulk of the paint you've put down. And you might decide to leave the gap you've then created because a slight disjoint between the position of the bulk of the wash and the new outline can add a sense of movement and life. So I've got another um, painting I want to show you, which is uh, done in a similar style of the same type of animal, but very different colouring and of an adult as opposed to a calf as well. So I'll show you that in a second. But I just wanted to include this, you know, removing the tape moment, because I always love doing this. I don't know whether it's as satisfying for other people to watch as it is for me to do each time. Um, but with watercolour, when you remove the tape, because it sort of auto frames the painting for you, um, I always feel it's a, it's almost a full part of the, the artistic process because only when you've done that, I feel, can you really see what you've got. And sometimes those little bits of white where you haven't gone quite up to the edge of the tape and then the white border runs into those, they kind of add to the painting as well. So, uh, so I just thought I would show you that as uh, also. But let me show you this other painting. So here's the uh, the first painting I did of this particular type of cattle. And you can see that, you know, it's a very different looking animal. We've got reddish orangey browns in the coat. There are some similarities in terms of the technique I've used, though. Uh, you can see I've used the same type of pen and then I've come in with watercolour and the background, the treatment of the background is very similar, except it's not quite as dark. But if you look at the cast shadow under the animal, I've used a similar technique there, again, different colours. And then if you look at the big patch of white on the chest, um, you can see I've got some of those greens in a subdued form reflecting off the chest. And I've put in some subtle purples and blues in the kind of white part of the socks. I don't know if that's the right terminology, but the patches of white on, on the legs. Um, so again, I'm pretty happy with that one. I think it's quite a characterful painting, characterful line and wash. Here's a look at today's video painting. And again, with that one, lots of different colours going on, lots of different textures and line work. So I'm really enjoying exploring this new subject. It's just a little bit of a twist on what I'm used to painting in terms of cattle. So uh, this is part one and there will be uh, another part at least uh, coming along uh, in the future, possibly with some more watercolour, but definitely at some point with an acrylic painting. Uh, thank you very much again to Jeremy from Two Mills for the references. Very much appreciated. Hope you enjoyed watching this video, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, please remember to like, comment and subscribe. And I hope to see you next Sunday for the next episode of The Sunday Art Show. Thank you very much for watching.